Uh, hello, this is going to be a career panel, and we're going to start off by introductions. Hello, assalamu alaikum. My name is Moira Rashid. I'm a physician, and I currently live in Dublin. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sabrine. I'm a family therapist, and I live in San Jose. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Duman. Uh, I'm in IT, and I live in San Jose as well. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Farhan, and um, I'm, a, I'm a finance professional. Now, what do you guys love most about your job? Okay, I had to write some stuff down because there were so many things that I loved about my job. So I'm just going to give you a briefing of it. So what I enjoy most about my career in medicine is the dynamic and deeply fulfilling nature of the field. Okay? Medicine is inherently driven and challenging. And despite years of rigorous training and continuous learning, there are no two patients that are the same. This constant variability ensures that each day brings new lessons and perspectives, fostering a lifelong commitment to growth and adaptation. It is impossible for me to become bored in my profession, which is very important because you do it day in and day out. Because the practice of medicine evolves rapidly, integrating these new discoveries and methodologies that keep practitioners engaged. However, more profoundly, the service aspect of medicine transcends material value. The care provided to patients, our patients collectively, is immeasurable in dollars or wealth. It is actually an act of service to humanity itself. My most rewarding moments are those when someone looked me in the eye and says, thank you for making my mom feel better, or thank you for explaining this so clearly. While these expressions of gratitude may not happen frequently in the fast-paced environment of American healthcare, when they do, they reaffirm that being a doctor is more than just a profession. It is a vocation, a commitment to making a tangible difference in people's lives. Additionally, the collaborative nature of medicine enriches the experience. Working alongside diverse teams of professionals allows for an exchange of ideas and approaches, making each interaction an opportunity to learn and grow. And I can tell you that after 23 years of being a doctor, I'm still learning and I'm still growing every day, and it's a reward within itself. Um, my answer might be a little bit uh, weird about what I love about my job. Uh, what I really love is being on the path of pain with people because as a therapist, often people come and are vulnerable. They talk about their pain. They talk about their hardships, their struggles. And I get the privilege of sitting with them through that and witnessing the journey that they take towards healing. And it's not an easy process. Um, it's actually very trying and tough and you know my family will tell you that as well this is my brother by the way um, um but you know it's it's a privilege to get to do what others don't and often in times of pain we're alone together um we're alone in in that journey but together you know it can help uh people in in kind of going through that struggle and hardship and I feel it is um, it is something not a lot of people get to do and not a lot of people get to witness. And so for me, that's the part that I love. The other part also is because I do, um, it's not only counseling and therapy that I do, I also do a lot of workshops and community education. Uh, I work with Khalil Center right now and we do a lot of Islamic psychology integration and we train clinicians in that too. And I love meeting people that are in this field and meeting the community because I feel I learn a lot from from you, from the community, and from the people that I interact with. And so being able to have that access and being able to meet with all kinds of people, hear their stories, their narratives, um, really uh, is, I mean, there are no words to it. It's what I really love, and it fuels me as well. I think it's, a, it's for me, a means of being of service and being with Allah's creation in the best of ways. And then providing to people what I can from, from the knowledge that I've learned, from the experience that I have to be able to benefit and, and to be of benefit to others. So it, it really is like an all-encompassing aspect. And, and I'm really grateful to be in the field that I am and the journey that it took to come here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi Shalli Sadri wa Sallam Ri wa Halul Qadatam Milasani Yafkaw Kauli. 
Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Sister Sabah and MCC for hosting us and for all of you for spending late Friday afternoon with us. Um, for me, being in IT, I think uh, variety was super important. Um, I was never into a technology geek and fully going to like being an engineer or being uh, you know really technical. I always enjoyed variety and solving a puzzle, and the puzzle that has always kind of motivated and fascinated me since I was your age or even younger, for some of the younger ones in the crowd, uh, was solving the people process technology triangle. What do I mean by that? People, working with people, figuring out what are the problems to solve, what are the technical solutions, be it systems or you know, creative ways of solving, and then also the process, like how do you put solutions in place that people can use and leverage and benefit from? And I think solving that has always been kind of putting that puzzle together. Uh, or different games, again, I'm probably dating myself here. Tetris was one of my favorite play, uh, games growing up. And you know, figuring out that puzzle was, was always kind of something that, that motivated me. Um, and I think still motivates me. And I think a couple of the panelists uh, said it, like always learning. And I think that's, that's something that, uh, again, feeding the variety aspect that, I, that motivates me, always learning and learning new things. And I think not just from a technological perspective, I think it's also learning how to do the things. And I think it's not the what that matters, it's the how that actually matters even more. And I think that's kind of what, what motivates me and, and keeps me going uh, in my career. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Uh, so for me, the, the, I would just say there are three things. First is learning. Uh, second is uh, inspiring and motivating people. And third is solving problems. Uh, so, you know, uh, the first thing I would say is learning. Uh, I am right now uh, as head of finance for a company uh, that is trying to bring new technology to market. Uh, and, you know, being uh, the head of finance for a public company, you uh, it, it's a new role for me. It's been, I've been in the role for one year. And uh, throughout my career, I have always had this um, phases where I, I'm typically in a job for four years and first year I really learn um, a lot and then you know I start making a difference and um, you know that shows up in um, in um, the work I'm doing and I get really good at it and by the fourth year I get bored and I want to look and do something different. So that's something that learning has always been important and I have always done and it has helped me grow. Uh, I started as a chemical engineer. I did that for uh, first uh, period of my career, then moved into product management, then became a Wall Street analyst, then moved into corporate finance, and now um, I'm heading uh, finance for a, a public company. So it's uh, it's just been the learning part, and uh, you know, as um, head of finance, you are looking at different things like accounting, um, how to get company to raise money and you know uh, how to help the company grow and all of those are new things and learning has been very important like other panelists have said and the second thing is um, helping and motivating um, people so you know uh, after a few years uh, in my job as I got into management I realized that the biggest impact I can have is by influencing and motivating people uh, because like you know when you make others better it's multiplies the effect multiplies so you know when um, in my role uh, i have a lot of people who report to me and um, you know i have to i have to get the best out of them there are times that the company is not doing well and i have to make sure that they still do the best job that they can do and so i like uh, motivating people and lifting their spirits and being uh, like a cheerleader for them. And uh, the third thing I would say is just making a big impact. Uh, so, you know, um, I feel like as a, when you are as a, in finance, uh, you can really optimize things and your job is to move things and resources, people who are working on less important things to more important things. And uh, that's something that, like, you know, as I get to do, and I really uh, feel that uh, when you are in an organization and at a senior level, you can make a bigger impact by um, having uh, 
influence on the, on the organization. So I, I like that as well. All right, <clears throat> great answers. Um, following up on the idea of helping others, uh, what advice would you give to fellow brothers and sisters for pursuing uh, these careers which you guys partake in in the future? And this advice should more specifically be towards, I guess, high schoolers or people who will be applying to college and planning how they will spend the rest of their life in a career. Oh, thank you. I think that's a very important question, and I specifically geared this to teenagers, especially from a cultural standpoint. So to the teenagers considering a career in medicine, my advice is simple, but it's very vital. Choose this path wisely. Okay. Medicine is not an easy or straightforward journey, and I cannot count the number of times that I've witnessed doctors and nurses feeling disillusioned or unhappy because they entered this field for the very wrong reasons, whether it was for financial gain, because doctors do earn um, quite a lot, and or to fulfill their parents' expectations. If wealth is your primary goal, know that there are other professions out there that offer greater financial rewards. And if making your parents proud of you is your primary motivation, understand that there are many other ways to achieve that. Choosing medicine requires a deep and personal commitment. Be aware of the obstacles you will face. Time you will feel, uh, time will feel like your enemy. Okay, you will make countless sacrifices over the years to earn the title of MD. While your friends may be out enjoying themselves at, mall, at malls or social gatherings, you'll actually be in your room studying uh, for exams or advancing your knowledge. And the demands of this path extend beyond just you. Your close family members, children, spouse, and friends will also make sacrifices to, um, to accommodate your rigorous schedule. After 23 years of working, I'm still working 12-hour shifts. I still work weekends. I still work holidays. And my family and my, my my daughter, they have to work around my schedule. Pursue medicine only if you have a genuine interest in it and a readiness to commit to the long hours, the years of training, and the relentless hard, hard work. This journey should be motivated by your passion and dedication, not by a need to prove a point or to make someone else happy. If you choose this career, do so because it resonates with you, because you are willing to embrace the challenges and sacrifices that come with it, and because you are determined and eager to make a difference in people's lives. Do it for yourself first, and then do it for others later. Okay, thank you. I think you should just follow that advice. <laughs> That's pretty much summarizing it. Um, just, I, I think everything Dr. Maria said, but to add to that, um, you know, for, for going into the work of therapy to really do your internal work. Um, therapy is, uh, and, and also one other thing about th therapists don't often make a lot because there's a lot of nonprofit work. Um, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of hours, but if you go into therapy for making money, there are a few therapists that may work with, I don't know, celebrities or might be some somehow somewhere up there, but usually therapy it doesn't involve a lot of it does involve a lot of internal work, and so make sure to do your internal work. The other part is start with intentions. Um, I think um, Dr. Morrow mentioned it too, but you have to keep setting your intention and keep renewing your intention because it will be a struggle along the way, and so uh, if you know, anyone that's been to workshops or um, uh, talks that I do, I always start with grounding and setting intention because it's a it's a process that keeps renewing. You can't always um, come in and say this is our intention because for us as Muslims, we have to be sincere in our work, be sincere in our service. And so in this path, know first what your intention is. Do the internal work because there are a lot of things we have to process. It isn't about the title. It isn't about the money. It isn't about um, anything of this dunya, right? What, what we are doing in this dunya is a means to akhra. It is a means to Allah. And so know that whatever career path, you know, there are four different careers here. Um, whatever career path you do go into, it is about how do you, how do you use that? How do you channel that to be a means to Allah? And so if it's a therapist, if it's a doctor, however you, you get to that point, and then talk to people, talk to trusted people, not just anyone, because you will talk to people that are 
in the field, medical field just to be there for the sake of money. And they'll tell you shortcuts and they'll tell you how to get around the system. But there are no shortcuts in life. You have to sometimes know and build that resilience in yourself that uh, unfortunately in this day and age, we're not used to. We have a, a, a very postmodernist society that is used to instant gratification, instantly getting what we want, having a, a, a very nafsani kind of element to it of you do you. And we have to kind of break those patterns. And that's where Western psychology and Islamic psychology sometimes differ. But I'm getting off tangent. Um, so I, I would say check your intention, keep renewing your intention, do the internal work, and then talk to people who are in this field. Talk to trusted people who are in this field. See what they're doing, what their path was towards this, where their challenges were, what happens when... Um, you know, even in the field of therapy, there are different specializations that can happen. What is your own personal narrative and how do you get to where you need to be? And then trust Allah in the process because we plan and Allah plans. So developing that trust in Allah is also part of the process of getting to the career that you want. Yeah, those are hard acts to follow. Um, and I'm going to apologize. Like, I'm passionate about this, even for mentorship that I do for professionals. So if I'm long with it, I apologize in advance. And I'm also going to give some general, I think, uh, advice that would go for any, any field. First, be prepared. And I think that's something that is really undervalued. And it's undervalued by people throughout their career. Even for this panel, I've spoken at other panels. Last night, I was preparing in terms of what, what I would want to say. Be prepared. And that's something that doesn't take any skill. Be on time. I think that's super important. Super important for yourself and your growth. Super important to show respect to the people that you're working with, studying with, whatever you're doing. And again, doesn't take any skill. Um, always do the right thing. And I was at Box, a company named Box, and one of the company values was make mom proud, which I think is the best way I've kind of heard that phrase, right? Do the right thing, right? And I think, again, tying it to our faith, even if mom's not watching, Allah's watching, right? Do the right thing. And sometimes the right thing might mean short-term pain, but do the right thing. Trust your gut. I think, you know, surrounding yourself with a support system, Sabrina mentioned that. I think I, I always use the phrase, I want to boldly go where others have gone. I'm not going to reinvent within, like, the IT field. I want to rely on people. Key thing, though, is people that you trust. And that trust is earned. That trust is developed. But make sure you're surrounding yourself with that support system. And that support system definitely starts with your family, your parents, and your loved ones, but also then people that are kind of experts in the field that you want to go in, right? I'm a huge sports fan, and if I use sports analogy, apologies to people who are not sports fan, right? It's a team sport, right? As you're thinking about your career, like, it is a team sport. Your success, you're going to be on the shoulders of others, and then, inshallah, you will pass it on to others in a similar gathering. So that's super important. Um, the other thing is knowing your encoding. All of us, Allah has given us an encoding. We have strengths, weaknesses. Nobody is strong in the same areas. Nobody is weak in the same areas. Know yourself. For me, for instance, even like the whole shmeel I give, technical is the thing that I'm weakest at given among my peers. And this is the thing that I enjoy the least. But I know that about myself. So what does that mean? When I have to learn something technical, I'm going to give it the right time to learn it. right? But I'm not going to... Self-awareness is super important in anything that you do. You have to know your strengths, cultivate your strengths, work on the weaknesses that are important in your field. That's super important. Um, working together, right? Collaboration is, is definitely important in terms of like anything that you do. For high schoolers, again, some of the things, and I'm going to apologize to the desis in the crowd and listening online, grades don't matter. And I really mean that. What matters is learning organization and priority. You have to learn that. That is the skill that's going to get you far in life. And also as a Muslim, that's important. I give, for instance, mentorship if you're filling a bucket. If you start filling bucket with small puddles and leave the big rocks, you're not prioritizing correctly. Fill it with the big rocks, the higher priority items, and then sprinkle in the pebbles in. And it's hard as human beings because usually those big priority items are harder than some of the smaller things, right? So that's super critical. Um, and then, you know, being being organized, right? Like that's super important. Know, know how you're going to get the thing done, right? Like you want to, you know, and again, it's the political season and it's, you know, terrible choices, everything, but 
the one example I want to use is like, in, there's no bill in the Senate that's passed without knowing the outcome. Be organized. Know who are the people that you have to talk to, as whether it's your career counselor, parents, which are the colleges you're applying to. Be organized. Don't just wing it, right? Um, and then kind of tying it to IT, uh, my profession, I think, again, knowing the skills that you're not, IT is very broad. You're going to specialize in certain areas, whether it's systems, whether it's IT, networking, security, data, et cetera. Pick the one that you're going to specialize, go deep, and then you have to go a little breadthwise as well, and that's super important. And then lastly, again, and most importantly, it is that, that trust that ultimately you tie your camel and then you rely on Allah. So do your best effort, and then whatever happens, whatever happens, whatever happens, it is the best for you whether in this world or inshallah in the next. And that trust, letting go and knowing that you're not the one in fully, none of us are, super important and super liberating. Super, super liberating. Uh, so I would say that um, for high schoolers, the thing I, I would say they should prioritize at first, I think in terms of learnings versus grade, you should prioritize learning. And, uh, you know, grades don't matter, but what you learn in your life matters a lot and it plays a part throughout your life. And so learn and always keep learning. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I mean, sometimes I wonder, I did chemical engineering and, you know, I studied a lot of calculus and I studied very advanced math. And when I started working, it was not, not once have I used calculus, even though I worked in engineering and, you know, the amount of time I must have spent in uh, in high school studying that was a lot, and even in college. So, like, you know, but, you know, just the learning portion, that ha learning how to solve the tough problems. Yeah, so, uh, as I was saying, learning is um, most important, and the ability to learn is something that you need to make sure that you learn in um, while in school. The other thing I would say is that uh, if I look back and when I was in high school, what I should have done differently, I feel like I didn't spend enough time on learning the language and spending as much time on learning writing. And and um, that's something that is very fundamental skill. And, you know, it's a lot harder to do it when you're older. So I would definitely say that among the subjects, at least learn good writing and uh, read as many books as you can. So that's something that I would always advise. Uh, the next thing I would say is that if you are going to enter any job, uh, you will the, your success will depend a lot on uh, the your ability to get trust of everyone that's working around you, like uh, Brother Norman said, and you know the uh, that is extremely important. So what what I'm uh, what you need to do is make sure that uh, you are spending enough time in other activities that like you know you uh, you are doing things where you are collaborating with others so like you know like whether it's in in your high school you're joining a club and doing some things with others in the club those extracurriculars matter a lot right like because they teach you how to work with others and uh, you know and making sure that if you promise something you do that so though, uh, that is something that I would say is uh, very important. Uh, the next thing I would say is like, you know, like at some point in your life, you will enter a corporate job and it doesn't matter whether you're great in college or you're in a great college or not so great college, uh, you will enter a job. But your success and how far you will rise will depend on how you do there. And uh, for that, like, you know, it will come down to how good you are at uh, communicating with others and building and getting their trust. So, you know, those are the skills that I think are very important. And, you know, you you should um, build on that when you're in high school. And, um, you know, and in corporate America, there are tons of jobs. And like Brother Nawan said, like, you know, don't worry too much. And, you know, uh, in the end, Try try your best, and in the end, whatever happens, uh, there will be something that you will be good at, and you'll find it. 
and uh, it's just that you know as long as you're working hard and uh, have the integrity in making sure that uh, you are uh, building trust and gaining trust of everyone that you're working with um, that will help you succeed thank you uh, one last question before we enter a Q&A is, I mean, the topic of the role which Islam plays on your, not only your life, but your job as well, uh, how do you think Islam plays a role on your job and your life overall? Well, I think it's everything. Um, I just want to date back a little bit to my career. So I started my medicine in Pakistan then went to the UK and did surgery, OBGYN, and internal medicine, gave my PLAB exams. Then I came to America, but prior to that, I did my USMLE. Um, and I worked for more than one and a half decades and decided to pursue my master's in public health, which I just completed, um, I think, a few weeks back. And I majored in data science, which is very different for me. So I've been through major institutions in different countries, and I can say that the most important thing to me is my faith. I wanted to just talk to you about a few hindrances and uh, about a few barriers that we had to face in our workplace. So it's been both a journey and a test. And know this, no matter what your career choice is, know that you will feel, face challenges and trials uh, being a Muslim here in America or any other European country. And medicine, for all of its nobility, is not exempt from this reality, okay? Institutional racism is very harsh and pervasive, and it is a reality, and it's an uphill battle for those that practice Islam. But it's worth it. To stand out and succeed, you do have to strive to work harder, be better, and cultivate strong connections with those in, the, in this field, but it's not easy. And the reason that I say cultivate connections is that when we were growing up, our parents used to say, if you work really hard, you're going to succeed. That's just part of it. You have to work hard. You have to tie your camel. But that's not success in the real world. You know, getting straight A's, like you mentioned, is not success in the real world. Working hard is part of it. Keeping your iman intact above all else is the most important. And thirdly, cultivating connections, who you know. Okay, Try to sit amongst people whom you would like to be. If you would like to go into medicine or finances, find mentors. And the best place to find mentors are actually at the mosque because there's so many educated people here. Find people that are older than you, that are on the path of deen, that can give you the right information. And you'll find that by cultivating connections and finding mentors, you have higher chances of success than just sitting in your room day in and day out and studying. Okay, so that's very important. From my experience, I have noticed that within the professional spaces, many communities uplift and support each other. And this is very important, and it might be a little bit racist, but this has been my experience in 23 years. Jewish physicians and um, healthcare facility often support fellow Jews. Hindus would support Hindus, et cetera, et cetera. Yet in 23 years of my career, I have seen that while many Muslims will excel and become great doctors in my field, there is often a lack of mutual support to help others rise. Okay, Hospital boards and leadership roles, and I say this with experience, they tend to be occupied by people who are not Muslim, Okay, making it crucial that when you reach a position of influence for the next generation, the next generation after this, and I hope you remember this, when you reach a position of influence, you extend a helping hand to uplift your fellow Muslims. Okay, If I were ever asked to choose between my profession and my faith, my faith would be my choice, 100%. I am fortunate that the hospital that I currently work in actually has a prayer room, but that has not always been the case. I've always had to duck in behind bushes to offer my prayers, both in the UK and America. I recall fasting during Ramadan when I was doing my residency in Atlanta. My senior was actually Hindu, and I had told her that I was fasting and I needed to open my fast. And she said, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't utilize your time for patient's time. And she did not allow me to open my fast. So from that day, I carried a date in my pocket, and I'd bend down and I'd read, and I'd eat my date, 
and I would forgo eating for several hours. At some point, I would make an excuse to run to the bathroom, and I would say, I have to go to the bathroom, and then I would offer prayers. I could not be seen. These are challenges that sometimes you face. However, in America, it's become more progressive, and hopefully for my fellow youngsters, it might be easier. But there will always be challenges. Okay, um, The list of challenges go on, but one thing remains clear. As a Muslim, you will face unique trials and tribulations. The worst thing you can do, however, is to compromise your practice and faith to either fit in or make others comfortable. I would like to give you another example of when I was in UK. Um, I asked one of the physicians that I was working in why everyone knew each other and how they were changing their dates and managing to get along with each other. And he said, well, after we work, we all go to a pub and we sit there and we drink and we make connections. And if you could just come to the pub once, you would see how many connections you would make. And I refused to do so. Of course, you will have challenges at that time, but I prevailed and I succeeded. You just have to stick Yes. Um, you have, just have to stick strong to your faith. So hold firmly to your faith, remain steadfast, and please listen. When you reach success, remember to help other Muslims and others, not just Muslims, who share your path. Okay? I thank you. Um, I'll start with a story, and, and I think this this might be something that people can relate to when I was in graduate school, um, that's kind of the, the, the peak of my finding faith and like kind of renewing my faith and um, learning, like being in, I went to Santa Clara University, being in an environment where it was very white um, and I looked different and I dressed different. I would wear a bias. Um, so I could really feel my Muslimness, right? But it didn't deter me from being Muslim and from practicing. And I remember, you know, walking in initially and kind of having people look at me and, you know, have a little squint or something. But when you connect with people and you connect to Allah and you have that um, firmness in Allah, it actually opens a light in others too. And faith is kind of, if you, if you imagine a tree, it's the roots that we have. And if, if we cut off the roots, we're basically, you know, stumpless. We're nothing. And in graduate school, I made a lot of connections with all of these. I was the only hijabi in my program. Alhamdulillah, there are now more Muslims coming in, and um, there are more hijabis. But, um, you know, people would see me praying in the corner because there was no prayer room at that time. So I would actually, we would have a lot of evening classes, and I would actually kind of skip out to go pray and then come back, and um, I would be walking around, and people would kind of know that this is like the hijabi. It was actually really funny. Once they had a, the school photographer come into the one of our um, our classes, and I was actually presenting at that time. And even then, the others, like all my classmates noticed, and they were laughing at this because he wouldn't take pictures of anyone else but me because I was the token hijabi, right? So they had to show in the school, like, oh, look, we have hijabis come here too. But what I, towards the end of my graduate school, I actually, the fruits of when you do practice with faith, um, you know, just a little bit of that is what I tasted is that people would come up to me. Um, friends that I hadn't seen for a long time, we changed um, courses and you know haven't met for a long time. I'd run into them at the school cafe and they'd be like, "Oh, I feel safe now, just by looking at me." And and it's nothing that I did. I wasn't going around saying, "Hey, be Muslim, say the Shahada." Like this is what we believe. I was just being myself, right? Which is what Allah teaches us to do. And for me, that was a very surprising statement because how are Muslims portrayed in the media? But someone who interacted with a Muslim who was completely normal is saying, I feel safe now being in the presence of a Muslim. And, and again, it's not me. It is Allah's light that they see, right? And we just have to follow that. I would actually have some friends, like we'd be sitting in class and they'd know now that Maghrib is approaching and they'd look out and they'd kind of whisper and lean over and be like, hey, don't you have to go pray now? And I'd be like, hey, okay, haram police. <laughs> I didn't know that, you know, I've kind of passed this on. Or when I would be going out to pray and kind of saying, excuse me, they'd lean back and say, hey, pray for me too. 
right? And and they're not practicing Muslims, but this is what faith does. And I want to present it because often we we feel like we have to carry this badge of faith and we have to like go out and you know feel it like burden, but integrate it into yourself. When you integrate it into yourself, there is a light that shines from you that you don't even know. There would be like, I, I would do demos of therapy in graduate school. And I'm talking about this because it, the next step, inshallah, after high school is college. And in college, you know, there's a different kind of Muslim community that you'll face. And you'll face a lot of non-Muslim people will be coming from everywhere. But, you know, it, it's it's important to be grounded in this when um, when I would walk around and I would go, um, you know, around places, I, would, I wouldn't I would be saying, like, I'm Muslim. They would know. And I remember this one, one of the girls that was in the class with me, she'd been in multiple classes, she came and sat down next to me once. Um, and I would do a lot of these demos with therapy and the professor would ask, like, you know, to kind of have a real story. Because part of my journey into therapy was I went through my own trauma and I went through therapy. And I found that when I went to non-Muslim therapists, they had no idea about how Islam was helping me. Because Islam was my therapy. And it's not for everyone. There's a different kind of, there are a lot of like conversations on that. But for them, it was very strange. And for me, it was very strange that they didn't know how like my faith was helping me, right? And so when I'm doing these demos, they're talking about like, well, what is the supporting thing? And what is the supporting line? And I was like, Allah, like I can. And then they're like, okay, can you, can you like imagine bringing his presence? And I was like, he's already here. Like, I can't imagine like he's here. And Wallahi, the people that were witnessing that demo session, what they said to me was at that moment when you said that we felt a light in the room and I'm not doing this, right? This is the power of faith. When I go into sessions and counseling, I am not going there on my own. I actually, I always make the dua of Musa, when I'm with someone in therapy, with a family in therapy, with individuals in therapy, when I'm doing a workshop, because it is not me. It is Allah using me as a wasila to, to talk to people, to be with people. And that's a blessing for me. And I can't take that lightly. I have to do that service with Allah. I can't do it without Allah. Um, Western psychology, that's what I studied. But Islamic psychology actually enhances the field of psychology a lot more. And I'm pretty sure there are a lot, there's a lot on this um, that you can hear. And, you know, I'm sure like you have a lot of access to it. But that is the foundation of who we are. If we forget our creator, if we forget who made us, who knows us best, um, our career, our journeys, they can never kind of go the distance, right? When you have that with you and you have that confidence that Allah is with me, it opens up the light to all of these things. And so faith is actually critical. Without faith, you're rootless. Like there, there's no grounding, there are no roots. And, and you kind of be like what the Prophet told us, the foam of the sea, right? That you just kind of be going everywhere. And we see that a lot with people. But I could keep going on with this, but I'm going to hand the mic. Uh, I think the short answer is faith is everything, right? It's the most important thing. Um, of course, there are other things that are important, but it's the most important thing. And, you know, that faith and, and trust in Allah is is super important. And it's also like, and I think both the previous speakers mentioned, it's also that connection. Like, talk to Allah. Talk to Allah about, you know, my problems, my good days, my bad days. We're all going to have good days and bad days. That's just a given. That's a guarantee. There's going to be ups and downs, ebbs and flows. That's what this life is. That's what this dunya is, right? Perfection, inshallah, is in, in, in the year after. And, you know, just like we're gathered here, inshallah, Allah gathers us all together in Jannatul Firdaus. I mean, um, taking that into account, in taking yourself into account in terms of your strengths, weaknesses, things that you're working on, that is super important. And I think like that does care enough, like doing it at some frequency, whatever you can is super important. And I do that and it's in all aspects, right? And you're gonna have those, you're gonna have moments where your faith and Iman is stronger. I have those moments where I, I feel it in, in, in my Salah. There are other times where I'm finishing it. I'm checking the box to go to my next meeting or go wherever. But you know, even in Salat al-Mustaqim, it's a journey. It's not a destination. You're gonna have that. And I think that connection 
with Allah, the connection with faith is super important, right? And I kind of alluded to it earlier. Success is in the hands of Allah, like whatever success, right? And and even your, your risk, what you're going to earn, it's written. doesn't mean that you don't work, but it's written. Don't stress on, on these things, and I don't stress on that. There are going to be times in your career, there are times in like, at least in my career, where I was let go. There were times in my career where I was doing well. There were times in my career where I was struggling. That shouldn't define like, you know, your success or your, like that ultimately is, how am I doing as a Muslim, as a human being? How's my relationship with Allah? How am I doing on, on the five pillars? How am I doing in improving myself? And it's not just the relationship with Allah. It's also the hukukul ibad. How are you with your fellow human beings? Are you of service to your fellow human beings in whatever capacity, whatever strength, whatever capability you all have? And I think that is super important to me. And again, I made a ton of mistakes make, and I'm going to continue making mistakes, right? And I think that's part of the thing is when you make mistakes, when you fall short, that's the blessing that Allah has given us, that you do astaghfar, you turn back to Allah sincerely. You may make the same mistakes again. I made some, the same mistakes multiple times. But that sincerity of faith is super, super important. And I think ultimately, right, like the thing for us to remember, this world is temporary. This world is temporary. The next world is permanent. And I think working towards that not that you neglect this, right? Like you have four people who, mashallah, are pretty successful in their career, and I'm sure you know others. Not that you neglect this word. Islam, Allah never says that. But focus on the ultimate prize. As I alluded, what's the bigger priority? Not that there aren't other priorities, but that's the biggest priority. And that's that's what kind of grounds me. And it honestly grounds me in even trivial things. As I mentioned, I'm a sports fan. If my sports team is not doing well, I'm raising my hands and praying. I, I am raising my hands and praying, right? Like... It, it it's a very like I said I use the word and I think that's the best word that comes it's a very liberating feeling where you're not even your relationship with your loved ones super important but ultimately when you realize that all you need is Allah it's a soup and not that you don't not that you're not going to rely on people the support structure etc you're gonna but it is very very you know Good feeling, and I would encourage everyone. You know, whatever frequency, talk to Allah. You know, in addition to praying, just talk to Allah. Like it's a very, and you know, I do that. I think from a career perspective, uh, you know, I think you know we're fortunate to stay living in the Bay Area, where generally it's more progressive, at least in terms of like, you know, I've had my last few roles. Like the company's not located in the Bay Area, so I've been working from home, which is a blessing not dealing with Bay Area commute alhamdulillah but um, box where I was we had a prayer room we actually had a designated prayer room and I don't know if they consulted a Muslim or not but there was actually a sink there as well which I was like wait this is like I don't even have to make wudu in the bathroom um, we had Ramadan events um, and you know we actually had Muslims at box even had a shirt which was uh, in the back it said hashtag Ramadan life and like we had a no water sign in the front because of course we all know that's the you know not even water actually was the thing because that's the most frequently asked question. Um, but it was always like, you know, practicing. And similar to Sabrina's story, I, was, I remember this was like 11 years ago. I was at Chicago for a work event, and somebody in the team asked, what time is sunset? And I was like, 7.49. He was like, that's what I love about you, Muslim. Like, you know sunrise, sunset, because we're in tune with the day, right? And I think, you know, again, those are things that, and everybody's going to be different. Some people are going to be more open, and some are going to be less open in that, you know, we're, introverts, extroverts, etc., confidence, whatever right factors in. But internally, be proud of being a Muslim. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but be proud of being a Muslim. And I think that to me is something that, you know, again, in my personal as well as professional life has carried with us, like fasting, praying, and, you know, yes, there are times where I've prayed in, like, parking lots. I've prayed in, uh, prayed in like, you know, target fitting rooms, uh, et cetera, right? But, like, but I'm not going to miss prayer, right? Like, I think that's super important. Um, and honestly, I think that's why five times a day, it's a good reminder as you're going through difficulties, whether in high school, ahead in college, like those difficult assignments or, you know, working towards that grade or whatever career path. And, and don't stop doing that, but don't sweat it and stress out on it, right? Like come back to a line, whatever problems, whatever. And it's also actually not even problems when things are good, being thankful. That's super important. It's not a, and I think that's something sometimes as Muslims, like we're guilty of that, that we turn to Allah when things are tough. No, when things are good, alhamdulillah. 
because everything is from Allah. Yes, He's given us, you know, innate abilities. He's given us a support structure, but everything is from Allah. Success, trials, everything is from Allah, and I think that's that's super important to kind of inculcate that. Uh, for me, faith is uh, very personal. Um, I think if I had to say the most important thing in my life that faith has provided me is that it has been a shield through every difficult time that I have gone through. And uh, it has also helped me appreciate life and be grateful a lot more. Uh, I grew up, um, you know, in India and um, I was fortunate to go to good schools and uh, to go to some of the best colleges in India. And, you know, I was often in situations where I was one of the very few Muslims. Like in my undergraduate class, uh, there were three Muslims in a class of 300. And like a, the Indi in India, about 20% of the population is Muslim. So, you know, it was a very good college and and very few people made it. And it wasn't that there was discrimination it was like you know like a blind test everyone took it and whoever did well but I feel that you know as Muslim uh, you always were in situation where there were a lot of thing people around you that were saying bad things uh, and being the only Muslim around there and you had to go through that and um, you know and I feel like you know like in US things are a lot better and but you know the one thing that I learned in that was that there will be always people who will be negative, but don't focus on negative, focus on the positives. And, you know, when you are faced with difficulty, there's always Allah and you can always uh, have him and help you right through the difficult periods. And I've always felt that, you know, as, as a, being one of the fortunate Muslims uh, and being very successful, uh, in uh, education when I was in India and then in my career uh, as well uh, you know I've always felt that I have to act better because I'm one of the few faces of Muslims uh, that people around me are going to see and so you know that has played a part in me uh, in how I have acted and how I have uh, worked hard because it always motivated me that like, you know, there are not many people who are Muslims in a CFO and I wanted to be there. And uh, the last thing I would say is that, look, you can have discrimination, no discrimination, but the solution is always to believe in yourself, work the hardest, work with the people and, you know, gain their trust, no matter what they think about you or your faith in the beginning. And so you have to overcome those challenges and be very positive in life uh, because that is the only way that you can be successful. You can never be successful if you're negative. And, you know, the faith is extremely important in providing you a positivity, um, even in the darkest of periods and giving you the confidence to take on risk um, because, you know, sometimes when you want to do things which can give you success, they come with a risk, right? Like I was an engineer and then I wanted to uh, switch over and go and work on the Wall Street and that required a lot of uh, risk taking because I was doing very well as an engineer and what if I was going to fail uh, on the Wall Street and, and yet, you know, you just believe in yourself and you know that things will always turn out right and like what Brother Naman said that in the end, the most important thing is the life after. So, you know, you don't care too much about this life and, you know, you do the things in your faith and you will be successful in afterlife. So, you know, in a way that um, this life is important, it's, but you don't have to stress too much about it. Uh, thank you all. Um, I guess... Lastly, if anyone has any questions to direct to either everyone here or a specific person who is pursuing a career similar to today. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Oh, I'll keep that mic. Yeah. Oh, 
Yes. Any questions? Any of the students? Anything from the sisters? Um, maybe one question. Uh, maybe I'll ask a question then. Ha have you ever felt felt self doubt? Like you felt like uh, this this problem that I've undertaken is too big and I won't be able to solve it or something. And how do you resolve a problem if you have self doubt? That's actually a very good question. Um, yes, self doubt many many times during the course of your career. Uh, in many different things. Um, number one, believe in Allah. Trust in Allah. It's helped me in numerous times. I remember the one word that my father taught me as a young child, gun. And in Urdu we would say, Hojai. It's done. So I have blind faith in Allah. Number two, whenever the task seems larger, remember that you can cut it up into small pieces. And that's what I've done often. If I look too much ahead and I say, I have to be here, I'm usually never successful. I start developing anxiety. Maybe you can help me with that. <laughs> but I divide it into small chunks. And for every chunk, there'll be a special prayer for my problem in namaz. And there is a special power in the hajjat after reading your five prayers. I find peace in the hajjat asking Allah for help. It's a time when everyone else sleeps and it's dark and it's just between me and Allah and I'm able to communicate. But once again, I do it in small chunks and I ask Allah individually for each problem. I take my time asking. I take my time thinking. Number three, whenever I have doubt, I write down the issues. I write them down and I see which one takes a priority because if you try to tackle seven things at the same time, you won't be successful. I, in my age, I never thought I would even look at data science. The first time they said R coding, I said, what's that? They said Python. I told my husband they're asking about a snake. That's how illiterate I was. And he said, I don't think you should do this course. But then I started doing it in small chunks. What am I going to do for the week? How do I address this with Allah? How do I address this with my class. And also, once again, even in my age, I look for mentors. I look for people who have done it before, who are willing to offer their advice. And for the young generation, do not be afraid to find someone you can follow. Take time out in your summer to go follow someone. You know, whether they're Muslim or not, if they're doing good in their profession, learn from them, learn from their mistakes, and then move forward. Self-doubt is very, like, imposter syndrome is very, I, I have it, and I think um, a lot of people do. Um, Islamically, there's a concept of balance, which is really good. We should have confidence, but we shouldn't, like, completely doubt ourselves. And it's kind of, the, the path is always, like, watching where that balance comes in from. Because if we're on one spe end of the spectrum, we're confident, like, I got this that's arrogance right and that can get you in trouble too but if you're on the other end and you're like i have i'm nobody i don't know what i'm doing i can't get this then also um you're going to be in trouble and having self-doubt what the way that i because i i struggle with it all my life I, I continue to struggle with it um but the way that i've channeled it is to make it more of what is the self-doubt coming to teach me and how can I connect back to Allah with it? Because when you do that, then you can channel that energy that you spend kind of like, because everything involves energy when you're um, kind of buried under the self-doubt and thinking about and, and being anxious about how do I do this, that takes energy. And if you kind of think of, okay, what is Allah trying to teach me here? Is this really something, really asking yourself, is this really something I can do? Is it just my self-doubt holding me back? Okay, how do I channel that to Allah? How do I put in, prepare, like, um, you know, uh, I was going <laughs> to... I, I stumbled because I was going to call him by his nickname, Noni, because he's my brother, and uh, he's known as Noman here, so <laughs> that's why I stumbled. Um and that's why he's laughing, because he knew that's what was happening in my stumble. Um, but to to have self-doubt be sometimes a power tool. If we think of, I, I always think of uh, Musa alayhi salam and the dua that he made when Allah gives him, you know, the, the, you know, go and 
talk to Ferran. He's like, you know, he give, makes this law, like, Allah, ease thy task for me and untie the knot from my tongue. And and give me my brother to as support, right? Because he's also, like, thinking and, in, in, you know, often reflecting on the stories that Allah tells us in the Quran and the stories of the, and the narratives of the Prophet says, um, it, it really teaches you how to take that self-doubt and balance it out with reliance on Allah and with the, the abilities that Allah has given you. Because each of us, Allah has given us abilities and there's to be, to, for us to be grateful and thankful for it is also to move forward with those abilities. Um, the dua that Musa Alayhi makes, I think, and it's one of my favorite duas. I, I honestly, I just keep repeating it all the time. Even when I'm like going to the mall and I need to get a dress, I like say the dua, even though it doesn't make sense. But you know, it's it's for Allah to be with you at every point. Um, the other part that I always think of is um, with self doubt. Where has it come from? So this is kind of going a little bit psychoanalytical, right? Where has it come from? How did it develop? What's the voice that you have for your self-doubt? Is it the people that are around you that are feeding that self-doubt? Is it are they, they're like more criti critical voices? And I'll, I'll warn parents with this because often parents can instill that self-doubt that can go to the other extreme of um, really debilitating their children. You know, constant criticism is not helpful. Um, constantly saying with grades, I think all three of the speakers I mentioned and I see in the crowd whenever grades are mentioned, the, the kids looking at their parents. But how are we talk, talking to our kids can help to either make this self-doubt stronger or weaker. Because are you are you trying to give fuel to shaitan or are you trying to give them a, a means to Allah? So recognizing the source of your self-doubt when you break it down is also important. So some elements of the self-doubt you can do away with when you know where this voice is coming from. Are they your friends? Is keeping your, the sohba that you have, that's very important. The company that you have can either make you or break you. So knowing if they are instilling that self-doubt, you know, maybe saying, are you sure you're able to do that? Oh my God, they picked you to do that? You know, it's... it's um, the tone, the way that they're clean, and to watch out for that. Who are you surrounding yourself by? There's so many concepts in Islam that actually are there to boost your confidence in things and to break that self-doubt. To know what these voices are, that's an important part of kind of fighting that self-doubt. And to know that Allah doesn't bring you where you're not meant to be. If Allah has put something in your path, and I know all of the speakers keep talking about Allah, but really, that's why I said at the beginning, develop that relationship with Allah. Your youth is the prime time to develop that relationship. It's it's the it's the best opportunity to do that. Um, but to know these steps, and then the other part of it is we actually have, and, and I'll end on this. We actually have like um, a Khalil Center. We do like a for our therapists. We do training every two weeks in didactics. And one of his speakers, he talked about the spiritual aspect of imposter syndrome. Because often we forget spirituality, right? to know like w how this imposter syndrome is really, um, and the self-doubt is really like to, to gain that spiritual aspect of it and kind of turn to Allah, that can be very empowering. And it's it's to to recognize these elements and these voices and the the, uh, the different aspects of the self-doubt that can help feed into where you can go. And it can sometimes be, uh, you know, Allah in his wisdom, he gives us these things. It can actually sometimes be better for you to have that a little Versus having that confidence and arrogance to be able to perform better. Because you rely on the source of everything. You don't rely on yourself as much, right? I think everything she said, I'm, I'm going to focus more on kind of my thing. I, I think self-doubt throughout, right? I think, And I think what I would say is like every time you're growing or increasing, whether in your career or whatever, like, there is going to be self-doubt. It can vary, you know, different amounts. And for me as well, it's very different amounts depending on how I'm growing or what I'm growing in. But that's always there. And I think part of the thing I think for that is you are taking the next step, right? If, you, if you're if you doing the same thing, you can kind of do it in your sleep, as they say, right? Like you can roll out of bed and do it. And so that growth, there's always going to be that self-doubt. And I think for me, that's been... A sign, one of the signs that, okay, I am growing and I'm progressing. And I think with that, then, you don't want, and Sabrina said, like, everything is in a balance. You don't want the self-doubt to 
consume you. You want it to be a motivation that, okay, I'm growing and I need to learn these things because I don't know everything and now I'm going to the next level in my career, whatever kind of personal and professional path that you're on that I've been on. Like that's always been like the case for me. Um, and I think like you've heard multiple times that mentioned Prophet Musa al Islam's Dua Rabbi Shadi Sadri. Even if you don't learn the Arabic, I would highly encourage to learn the English. It's it's a very liberating Dua and really powerful Dua. And I use it for every meeting, every difficult conversation that I'm having, uh, work or personal, like I use it. Another good one that I use as well is Rabbi Zid Nilma, which was Prophet Sallallahu Dua, which is again very apt for you know, all of you in high school and college, and even as, as we've all said, you're always learning. It's basically, will I increase my knowledge? Um, and other du'as that, you know, and again, and if you don't learn the du'as, just like I said, talk to Allah. Say it in, you know, English, Urdu, Arabic, Persian, whatever language, right? Like, I think that's, that's been important for me. Um, and then it's also like, how, how have I overcome that? And I think that, again, is like, you know, for me, and again, this is just purely from like a professional perspective, three is a number that I like. I have three mentors uh, that I trust and have established that relationship and have seen the results that I will ask for advice in terms of like growth. And again, find your network that you can, because again, you need that support structure, right? And again, you've heard everybody say it, people that you can trust. And trust is earned. Tr trust is betrayed very quickly. If there's somebody like at a certain point, you're like, okay, I don't trust this person find another person, right? And I think that has been super important um, and helpful for me to overcome self-doubt throughout the career and kind of, again, on the journey to kind of to grow. Um, I think the other thing as well, like I mentioned, is like you're not, like there are going to be strengths and weaknesses, right? So even as you're growing, there are going to be those strengths and weaknesses. And again, cultivate your strengths, focus on certain weaknesses. Again, the balance, which, you know, is very important from an Islamic perspective as well. Don't be consumed by your weaknesses. And I think Sabrina alluded and mentioned this directly as well. I think in the era of social media, it's even more. I can trust, I can assure you, whether it's like Facebook, Instagram, or whatever, you young people now, like, you know, I gave up on Snapchat, after Snapchat, I gave up. Or like LinkedIn, which is like a professional kind of social media site. People are going to put their best. If Sabrina and I are fighting or arguing, we're not going to, you know, post that on, on social media. You know, if you're having boba or whatever, then we'll, we'll kind of post that. Like everybody's going to put their good side out. And a lot of times, and I found this in my career with myself and I've seen it to others, people, in order to boost their confidence, exactly what someone said, you, it's not that they're going, they're attacking you. They're just boosting their own lack of confidence or trying to increase in their confidence. Don't get consumed by that. And I've had that happen to me as well. And Alhamdulillah, that's where I think like my faith has helped me. Be like, I, at the end of the day, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. You know, if I don't get the growth, if I fail, I failed. It's okay. And I think that has kind of helped me overcome, like, the... Uh, I just took a new role, like, 10 weeks ago. I helped out right now. I still have self out. I'm still learning. It's okay. Get comfortable with that, right? Get comfortable with that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree that, like, you know, every time I have taken a new role, I've always felt that I have a lot of self-doubt. And especially when you're doing new things and harder things than you have done in past, you end up with some self-doubt. And I think having some self-doubt is good because it kind of tells you that, hey, you need to work harder. And it forces you to uh, put in more work and, you know, overcome that self-doubt. And yeah, like, and you turn to pray as well. Like, you know, you speak to Allah and and say that, hey, uh, just help me out here. And, uh, and you know, it just helps your confidence during that time, uh, knowing that there's someone else who's uh, there to help you. Um, and, you know, just knowing that things will work out in the end uh, helps you overcome the self-doubt. Yeah, maybe we can close now, Shira. So right, thank you sure. so much for coming, everybody. And thank you, panelists, for sharing your knowledge. And Brother Munir for letting us host it here. Uh, there's some, if you guys want to reach out to any of the panelists, feel free to do that. And there's some snacks out there uh, that's for you. So thank you so much. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure.